All right, here we go. So welcome to the my closet. I've got a little closet, just moved to Prague, Czech Republic. In this video, I thought I would just try out going live. Uh, and now I realize if I've got full screen, um, I need another monitor to see the chat. So in the future, when I'm live, of course, I'll be able to interact with you on chat. But right now, I guess I'll just do this. And if you have a question, feel free to write the question in chat and I'll try to get around to it by the end. Basically what I did in this presentation is I made a PDF of a hundred different drawings from a hundred different artists and I think they're really good for people to look at who might be trying to figure out what type of style they want to draw. I, I don't necessarily like the word style and I instead like to think about techniques and processes that artists use in their drawing. Basically, it, it, it means their style in the end, but sometimes when I hear that word style, it's like, how do I find my style? And it's like, a little bit. Um, but anyway, I've, I've put together a, a pretty diverse list of artists and drawings with a lot of different types of mark making, and hopefully by looking at these different artists, you can also come away with something and maybe find somebody new or also find some techniques that you want to explore more. So let's get into it. First artist I have is Grace Samosir, and uh, she's a younger artist, contemporary, living right now. And she does a lot of sketching from life, and you can see oftentimes she has these two images that are kind of overlaid on top of one another, kind of giving this idea of time passing or something like that. She's also got a lot of great portraits. I love her portraits, um, drawings. A lot of them are done in colored pencil. She's using these kind of washes on top of them that you can see as well. Uh, wash ink, ink washes on top of colored pencil drawings. Here's Michael McCaffrey. He's a professor at University of Kansas. And when we're looking at these drawings, you can see it's almost like Giacometti, which I think I have later on here too. But he's really searching for different planes. You can really see that He's really looking for how these planes, That's a, by plane I mean a big flat area that indicates form on the face, like this side of the nose right here. And all these different planes intersect and create this big you know, geometric shape, which is the head. But these feel very volumetric, and you can really tell that it's a search. He's really searching for all these different lines. So I think one thing, good thing to think about is that in drawing, Oftentimes we don't need to have a finished drawing at the end that's all perfect and all like this. You know, drawing is the act of looking and syncing up your hand, uh, the pencil, with your eye. And that can often be a search because, you know, the first line might not be the exact perfect one. So we can use, we can sketch, we can sketch lightly and we can find uh, these different planes of the face and these different shapes. Here's Allison Summers and she's primarily works in gouache. But she's got a lot of really great pencil drawings that I like as well of these these figures. They're kind of anim anatomical anatomical <laughs> figures, and um, they're really you know soft pencils overlaid on top of paper. But it's kind of nice to see what you can do just with paper and a couple pencils. You know these are more um, they're less structured on line. You know you can kind of tell that she paints a lot because there's these big areas of shadow. Um, and there's less line, you know, less line work like we'd see in comic booky type stuff. So this is a very painterly looking drawing. This is a, a guy named Skinner, and kind of the classic 1980s, you know, heavy metal t-shirt sort of look. And these are these are done in colored pencil under drawings. A lot of times they would use this one colored pencil, which was blue, Prismacolor blue. And they used to call it Xerox blue, actually. And the reason it was called Xerox blue was because it was a blue that couldn't get picked up by a Xerox machine. That's a machine we had to make copies back in the 70s and 80s. And so you could make black and white copies, and the blue, for some reason, uh, the sensor on the machine didn't see that blue color. So a lot of times artists would draw with this blue. And uh, that's how it became known as Xerox blue. So oftentimes you'll still see comic book artists and a lot of different artists using this light blue color in their sketches. And the preliminary sketches for these, these are done in that, that light blue color. And then obviously a ton of hatching goes into this. You know, the, the trick with hatching is 
the shadow that's darkest, start from that point and then, you know, go out. So your line is getting thicker uh, down here, and then as you wisp it towards the lighter area, it gets lighter and lighter. Um, so a lot of these are done from, from memory, I believe, but he probably uses some, some source material uh, from time to time as well, I'm sure. Here's, here's the guy that got me into painting, really, uh, Ralph Steadman. So when I was 17 years old, I really, really wanted to draw. And my parents, there was, a, there was a guy who was down at the mall named John Twingley. He was down at the mall, and he was making airbrushed T-shirt drawings. And I thought they were just the most, the coolest thing I've, I'd ever seen in my entire life. And then I started seeing his drawings, and he had gone to art school, like, a, you know, a state university. And, um, but these were, he was, you know, had all these life drawings, and he was very serious about drawing. And that was kind of the first person I encountered that was really serious about drawing. And I knew this was like a person who was devoting, uh, you know, seven, eight hours a day easily, if not more, just to drawing. And so that was really inspirational for me from a young age. His dad was actually my art teacher in high school, but he introduced me to this guy, Ralph Stedman, and um, I actually started doing private lessons with him, with John. And they were, the, they were some of the best memories I have of drawing. Honestly, every lesson we just went places and drew together, and I just sat down next to him on the, on the grass or wherever we were. We went down and drew a carnival one day, uh, together. That was pretty awesome. Uh, another day we had like a liger and I keep thinking maybe it was the guy from Tiger King that brought the liger, uh, that we were drawing. Cause it was like a guy with a mullet, but maybe there's a lot of mullets going on with the tiger biz. Anyway, Ralph Steadman, he's, he's most famous for, uh, the drawings he did for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with Hunter Thompson's book. And oftentimes there's a great video on him. You can check out on YouTube. Uh, just, you know, YouTube search Ralph Steadman drawing and you'll find it. And he just starts off with these splatters. And the thing with the splatters, you got to do them the night before, right? A lot of times people want to start splatting and then drawing on top of them. You like, it's just a really simple thing. You got to splat one day and then draw the next. So if you're doing this type of drawing and you want to start off with this splash and splatters, it's good to have some time just to let it dry because it, you know, it bunches up, it's wet. Ali Lemon, this is this is one of my friends, and she makes these, I don't even know, what, whimsical, surrealistic shapes that are kind of cascading in and out of space in this infinity loop of some sort. And I really like all these forms. And these are just pencil, once again. So looking at how much you can do just with pencil itself, and, you know, all these different types of line. This almost looks like a comic book, a uh, black comic book line coming down the side here but these are really painterly a lot of these lines just big areas of of shadow moving in and out one thing to look at with this is there's no smudging going on there's none of this smudgy smudgy with our fingers uh, this is all just using the 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 tooth of your paper lightly using that pencil on top of it to to create different gradations of value itself so it's good not to kill your paper when you're working with it. Just a good thing to remember in general. Here's Danny Farrell, and he does a lot of Prismacolor drawings, um, just colored pencil drawings of men with their little dogs, predominantly gay men with little dogs. And he's got a lot of these, but you can see all this amazing variation you get with these Prismacolors and just how soft the the line work and the the shadows can be with these as well again becomes very very painterly sasha gordon everybody should uh follow sasha gordon on instagram she's i think i don't know how old she is right now i think she's like 23 or something like that um or there they're 23 and um basically They've got extremely nuanced paintings and drawings as well. And I think that really <laughs> it's some of the most exciting stuff that I've seen coming up right now. Especially their paintings are absolutely gorgeous and unbelievably rendered um, for their age at this point. So 
check out their drawings as well, and you'll see that, again, it's a really painterly approach, but look how there's not much happening in that finger. Look how much we get of that entire hand just from this little indication of a figure, you know, a finger like this. There's not all this detail going on inside of it. It's all, there's not a need for all this detail. It's just hinting at detail all around it. Nicole Eisenman uh, is one of the most important figure painters living today. And you can see these types of tonal drawings creating, look at how this form, going around the form with the mark, always important so you don't flatten it out. You can just look at how flat this looks in the back and then look how this form kind of goes around that shape right there. And that's like having your mark model the form in the direction that it's going. Todd McFarlane is a comic book artist, and so he started off just drawing uh, in pencil and then putting, you know, ink on top of that with the old, old school ink pen and pencil. That's all you need. It's kind of one of the amazing things about painting and drawing is that really you don't need that much in order to, to do it, and it hasn't changed. It's one of the frustrating things about painting and drawing as well is because you know, you, like, it's like, I have the same brush as you and the same paint. Why is my paint not doing what your paint is doing? Um, but Todd, Todd McFarlane, he's got another, he's got a great interview. Check that out as well if you can. And basically, he says in this interview that he was looking at comic books and he was like, man, man some of these are, some of these drawings are, are really terrible. Like, I could, I could make terrible drawings too, you know, um, for comic books. And so he looked at the body and he drew a different part of the body every week. So he focused, one week he just focused on hands. Next week he just focused on the forearms. Next week just on the biceps, you know. And he learned how to kind of Frankenstein all these pieces together, at different angles and all this sort of stuff, and just muscle memory. And uh, he became, he's one of the most, um, you know, important comic, living comic book artists, uh, certainly today, and huge in the toy business as well. But it all came back to drawing, literally sitting there. No special tablet, no Cintiq tablet or any of this sort of stuff. Pencil and paper. That's how people learn drawing. I know everybody wants a shortcut with some digital thing. It, yeah, digital's great. You know, you can do a bunch and you can erase them. But when it comes down to it, all you really need is a pencil and a stack of copy paper. That's enough to make you really, really good at drawing. And Todd McFarlane is the perfect example of that. Somebody who just pushed his way through and practiced a lot every single day and created, you know, an empire based on that. Hebrew Brantley is an artist. These are just some different doodles, but you can check out a lot of his... Um, he's primarily a painter, but he creates a lot of these these characters that are, like, existing in this, this kind of uh, futuristic made-up world that he's created for himself. And I just like thinking about doodling, you know, in general. You know, it doesn't have to be when we're creating paintings or creating drawings, it doesn't have to be this serious approach that everybody's thinking about. You can just you can just come to it and just make. Don't worry about it. Just just draw. That's doodling. That's kind of just getting the brain out and getting the brain moving, not worrying about every single little detail and all this sort of stuff and hodgepodging all these things together to create a piece. Kyle Staver creates a lot of uh, paintings and uh, primarily paintings and this we can see you know this looks like it's actually a print or probably ink wash with pen so again really simple materials ink brush water pen and a lot of these seem kind of mythical they have this mythical quality to them and oftentimes there's this really really bright light source as well that is illuminating the figure that you can see um, in these paintings too. So there's usually this really strong, almost dramatic light that we see coming into them that gives us this kind of eerie uh, approach, I guess you could say. It's almost cinematic. It looks like cinematic or theatrical lighting in a lot of these paintings. Picasso, Picasso is ridiculously amazing. If you haven't dug into Picasso yet, there's a reason why he's so good. Um, Picasso made more works of art, first of all, than anybody else ever um, that I'm aware of. It's like 26,000 
artworks. Um, so he was somebody who was just constantly making. It didn't matter if it was ceramics or sculpture or drawings or printmaking or painting, silk screens, you know, whatever uh, Picasso was making it. And here we see a classic Picasso um, subject, which is the bull, and, you know, just beautifully drawn. Look how, oh, just how confident these little wispy marks are here. But look at this face. You can see there's a racing going on. There's some erasing going on there. There's actually a great video you can watch called uh, Picasso Mystery, if you can find it. And it's a French film, and it's nothing but Picasso drawing, basically. He's like got a piece of glass in front of him, and he's using a Sharpie on the glass, more or less, so it bleeds through the paper. So you can kind of watch Picasso make a, make a painting. Um, and there's some, you know, dramatic editing where he's got, you've got 30 seconds left to finish the painting or whatever. And Picasso's smoking and trying to finish and changing things and switching the painting upside down and turning it into something else. And watching him work is, is really fabulous. But dig into Picasso more. There's endless amounts of stuff on Picasso and drawing. You can never get enough of Picasso. George Kondo is a contemporary artist. I think he's probably in his 60s now. There's another great video of him drawing on the Louisiana channel here on YouTube. And um, he makes these feel like kind of contemporary versions of Picasso that we're seeing um, in a lot of these as well. But we can see, again, just pencil and paper and the face coming apart into these different pieces. But it's also, it's not just messiness. There's a lot of form happening in a lot of these pieces as well. So pay attention to all that form going on, how you're twisting around those contours coming around form, coming around space to indicate how big the, the pieces are. Frohawk Two Feathers is a, a really cool artist, I think, and he deals a lot with creating totally fictionalized narratives of an a, of a alternate narrative of what happens in America. So he's he's got kind of a Native American character who is also African American and has this whole concept of you know, if black people like came, I don't know if this is totally pot, the, the right narrative, but like got into these positions of power and had taken over America. And he creates this whole separate narrative all about the United States and colonization from a, a totally different angle than what happened. So he kind of owns it in a different way. So you can see in these, these paintings, there, there's these, you know, simple little start off with what looks like pencil drawings and then some watercolor on top of that. Here's Alberto Giacometti who is one of my favorites but again look for those searching lines. He was primarily a sculptor, was known for being extremely difficult on himself. Some of his quotes are just unbelievably dark where he talks about like I don't see anything in my paintings I only see darkness and black you know and um, he was he was making sculptures and he kept on making them smaller and smaller and whittling them away and making them smaller and smaller until they were just these little things like the size of a match literally like the size of a matchstick one matchstick and it started off this big and, he just, and kept on getting smaller and smaller and cutting away and you can kind of see the same searching process for these different forms that make up a face and make up a head. But if you want some great volumetric sketches of heads, can't do better than Giacometti. Mary Cassatt, here we can see a lot of the, um, again, just portrait, bird, woman, seated, right? We don't have to go crazy with their compositions. We can just, we can stick with the same compositions, you know, and, um, that becomes the subject. What's the subject? It's interesting whenever you look at a painting or drawing, that's the first thing that gets communicated. What's the subject? Kids get this almost 100% of the time. Show a kid a drawing, they'll be like, oh, that's an elephant. That's a, you know, they know exactly what is the subject of a painting. As we get older, um, we start intellectualizing too much and we start reading into things and like, what is this drawing really about, you know? Uh, what is this painting really about? Maybe it's just about the subject. Maybe it's just about a woman with a parrot sitting. Do we need anything more? I don't think so. Jenny Seville. Jenny Seville did these really splashy paintings. She's one of the young British artists 
um, in the 90s she became famous. I actually got to go to the same school that she went to in Glasgow, at the Glasgow School of Art, um, in this unbelievably beautiful Macintosh building built by Charles Rennie Macintosh. And um, she's got these fantastic drawings. Again, we can see it's not about the finished project. It's not about making everything perfect. That process of creating the drawing is in the drawing. It's not even a technique. The technique is looking and searching for lines, right? So we don't even have to think about, you know, necessarily imitating her mark itself, but rather the entire drawing itself, the process of searching for these different forms in the drawing. Tracy Emin, also a young British artist, and I think she actually teaches drawing at the Royal Academy right now, and she was known for making these sculptural pieces like bed and tent and stuff like this, and she's got a lot of pretty um, explicit drawings as well of herself throughout the years, but I think she's got a really lovely approach, and here we just see, you know, this is probably one uh, one calligraphy type nib, but all the different angles and all the different line variation that you can just get with that one nib is pretty amazing. John Twingley, this is the guy that I was drawing with growing up, and he's since, you know, he's done the cover for like the New York Times uh, book review, and a lot of other, been in Rolling Stone and all these other magazines now. And he's somebody that I know is just constantly drawing. He's he's drawing a lot of musicians, and he's drawing a lot of um, characters from fictional uh, books and stuff like that as well. So I, I'm not sure what this is from. It's like a man with a cat in a uh, some sort of ocean scape. But I just love his drawings. You can see up in here, he's just he's just got a toothbrush, and he puts ink on the toothbrush, and he'll mask off a lot of these areas. In different areas and then you just with the toothbrush it's kind of like a airbrush effect so you can make this make certain areas built up just with the splatter of a toothbrush and uh, again it looks like some black maybe black acrylic paint in the background but this is really just pen looks like pen toothbrush um, and some brush and ink but he's follow him on follow him on Instagram uh, he's in he's in New York and just constantly making drawings of people that he does from life in New York City. It's a great way to actually just see the city itself. Trent Doyle Hancock, he was actually slated to be part of an exhibition with Philip Guston this year that that got not canceled um, but got postponed because the the museum curators didn't think we could possibly digest. Uh, Philip Guston and Trenton Doyle Hancock together, I guess. Um, but he he's an artist that also creates this fictionalized world and different African-American characters that exist within it. But just from a drawing perspective, here again we can see a really wandering line, that idea just taking a line for a walk. But same elements are always at play. We got some gray, gray marks and we got black marks, right? So if we were looking at this drawing, at first we might just think, oh, I got to draw like that. But there's actually two, looks like there's, he was doing a wash, a little bit of a wash. That just means a little bit of water with your ink to get these kind of grayish marks. Here you can really see it, the grayish marks and the black marks on top of it. <clears throat> so just these simple variations can change things a lot too. Nancy Sparrow creates a lot of... Um, you know, as you can see here, kind of ripping on Picasso a little bit and, and bringing her own ideas into that and the image of women and how we look at women um, themselves. These are these are done, these are prints uh, that were finished here. And you can actually see there's some like photographs that have been collaged into these as well. But again, pretty, looks like <clears throat> pretty simple materials, but this does look like it's a print. Agnes Martin. If you want to read, like if you go to art school, you're you're going to have to read Agnes Martin at some point. And she actually wrote beautifully about art, and she created a lot of really meditative, methodical drawings like this one with, again, just looking at pen, ink, paper, or she would use pencil and take a really methodical approach to these. Hollis Dunlap I went to school with, and uh, he I believe he still teaches 
at the Lyme Academy. I'm not sure what it's called now in uh, Lyme, Connecticut, but really fantastic figure painter, a really built up approach, a really painterly approach to these drawings, you know, just blocking in these big marks and then tightening up on the details where need be. Look at how tight this is compared to how loose this is and how well they both work together. Katie Kolwitz is a German artist. Uh, I think she was World War I. I'm not positive. I, I'm pretty sure she also lost her son in the war. So she's got a lot of great drawings, um, anti-war drawings. And uh, charcoal paper. Here's a self-portrait. And again, not smudgy smudgy. We're just using the, the tooth of the paper to just, you know, carve that charcoal off the end in order to create our darks and our lights and all those sort of things. Matt Bollinger is a painter. He's out of New York. I think he teaches at SUNY in, in New York. And he creates a lot of paint uh, drawings. These are big drawings. And you again, you can see, just look at how much you can do just with graphite and the eraser, using the eraser to make marks. And use, look at those marks, how they go around the contours of that form again as well. And um, with, with Matt Bollinger, he's often creating different drawings based on imaginary characters. So I know he did some paintings of his mom's dorm room, like she recounted what her dorm room looked like, and then he made some paintings of that like from memory. <clears throat> He's also really interested in, in still lifes and how um, objects can tell a story about people, I guess would be a really simplified way of talking about it. But fantastic, absolutely fantastic drawings. Just love this. You know, it feels kind of cartoony. He actually makes animations as well. Um, frame by frame animations of paintings and drawings that you can watch um, which are really cool too but you can see how simplified these shapes are but how what a good drawing it is at the same time you know foreground uh, middle ground background that nice little light in the back up against the dark oof it's nice Rebecca Morgan I had a studio visit with a couple years ago and she's she makes a lot of drawings about Appalachia where she comes from and kind of subverting ideas of femininity as well by making these uh, monstrous looking Appalachian characters um, that are kind of like supposed to be sexy at the same time and revolting. But again, really simple materials looks like watercolor, pencil, and that's pretty much it. I bet this is just watercolor and pencil. Um, this doesn't look too much like watercolor up here, I'm not sure. But this certainly seems like it. Derek Zabrotsky. Well, I was thinking about, you know, concept art, and a lot of people are creating, you know, when, it, when they get better at drawing. This is what I think a lot of people mean when they say, I want to get better at drawing. And so there's an entire uh, faction, I guess you could call it, of drawing, which is called entertainment design. And so that means they're, they're using drawings for video games or, you know, movies, or they're making 3D you know, animations for films and stuff like that. And that that requires a very certain approach to building people, building characters, building environments. And often it's based highly on, you know, perspective and shading in order to, you know, make the picture plane look realistic. Make it look real, right? That that That's kind of a goal of a lot of this. Get your ideas down quick and then we can translate that and make it look real. We're not interested in being Agnes Martin and making squares on a piece of paper. If you want to draw like this, you want to create something that other people can look at and then use your idea to create something with it. Ang, um, Ang is just known as being like the best drawer of all time. He probably is. I, I find him kind of boring actually. Um, I know he made fun of Rubens, and I like Rubens, so um, I don't know about I, if I can go to bat for Aang uh, since he was making fun of Rubens. But anyway, um, he makes drawings of rich people being very polite and nice. And, of course, they're great compositions, and they're, they're gorgeous line work. Um, everything you could want in just a simple pencil drawing is Aang. Kara Walker makes a lot of these giant drawings dealing with race, uh, these types of issues in America and oftentimes we'll put them directly onto the walls um, 
of of places. It looks like this does have some sort of a, a frame which is on it. But again, you can see probably just ink uh, that's been watered down to get those types of grays and that sort of stuff there. Vincent van Gogh was would always be known as, um, you know, he painted like he was, they say he, he painted like he was drawing and drew like he was painting, if that makes sense. Um, so his paintings, they often have a lot of dark lines in them that are kind of more synonymous with drawing itself. And in this drawing here, <clears throat> we can see he's really building up these forms. Look at these trees, this just amazing contours going on into these trees. And he would use what's called a reed pen often with these, which is literally just a bamboo stick that's been cut at an angle. And it's got a, a thick, uh, it's got a flat, square on the bottom basically. So you take a piece of bamboo, it's a circle, right? Cut it at a 45 degree angle, you got a tip. You got a tip on the end. That's all it was, a reed pen. You'll find them, uh, different art stores still have them. Or just take a stick, you know? See what happens. Um, Van Gogh, amazing drawings though, of course. Oops. My Ruznik, uh, these I, I just like for their simplicity. Again, simple wash here. This looks like ballpoint pen. Um, but look at, you can get these kind of nice explosive effects just with the ballpoint pen, um, what appears to be, you know, a ballpoint pen. If not that, it, it looks like an office kind of pen. It's got this office penny feel to it that I kind of like, though, that you get those bunches of lines that you can't get with, um, with like a dip pen or something like that. Mobius, um, oops. Mobius is an amazing drawer. He's kind of known for creating this entire, you know, futuristic world with his paintings um, as well. French artist Jean Giraud is his real name. And again, pen and watercolor. Look at those blends. This is back in the day when, uh, when painters, you know, they would be the way we think about 3D designers maybe now, or somebody, you know, creating Toy Story. Um, we kind of had advertisers that would need all sorts of things back in the day and one of those things was movie posters. Mobius didn't make any movie posters but um, a lot of these artists that were kind of commercial artists they just drew all the time you know imagine drawing 12-13 hours a day they got really good. Uh, check out a video of Mobius Jean Giraud drawing he's got big pieces of newsprint that he draws with that are pretty awesome and uh, you can find that on YouTube. There's also a great movie called Jodorowsky's Dune, which is about the Spanish director Ale Alexander Jodorowsky, Alejandro Jodorowsky. And um, he wanted to make Dune uh, back in the 70s. And then they basically took his whole crew and they made Alien um, instead of made Dune. But he had this amazing idea to make Dune. And, and that's a great movie to watch if you're just interested in how artists think and how concepts work in creating movies and just how passionate directors have to be in order to create a film. Raphael, of course, uh, you know, studied under Da Vinci. The kid was good, right? <laughs> what do you got to say? Um, I always think of him, I don't know why, I always just think, because I know he, he did that, he did this self-portrait when he was like 14 and it's amazing. And I was just, because of that, I think I've always just thought of him as a brat but he maybe he was a nice guy. I don't know. But amazing drawings. Look at uh, look at these hands. Simple to the point. Amazing. <clears throat> the Voynich manuscript. I included this just to just to think about drawing as something where you can create an imaginary document. So this was a, a document that was I think it was supposed to be a fake of a, an ancient book that somebody made and sold. Uh, sold to a collector like 130 years ago or something like that. But it had all these different ideas for plants and, uh, you know, how plants would have different healing properties and how to mix them together. And it's in this ancient language, which I think has been found out to be some version of ancient Turkish, actually, uh, that's in the creation of these. Uh, it's You can't read it, you know. Nobody could read it. It took them forever to figure it out and then somebody finally did and it looks like it's Turkish I guess but anyway think about drawing as something that can create 
not necessarily even a drawing. It can be a book. It can be a made-up book. It can be a fake made-up book about plants that's kind of real. You know, and it, it's a medium that can make all different sorts of things. Megs Monroe, you can just look at these and see these, you know, thinking about the old school techniques again. They used to have sheets of, of paper with little dots on them that they'd give to cartoonists. And they would literally just cut these little transparent dot papers and they put it on their drawing in, in order to make the, the cartoon print well because they were using just black and, and white. So they would have to use these little dots for their, their values. And you can see Megs Monroe also uses that old school kind of printing technique to create these different variations in value and collage. Nicholas Aribe, I've talked about before, he's got the most amazing uh, YouTube channel on YouTube called Our Painted Lives and just a fantastic drawer and seer of, you know, just observer of life, I think. Check out his videos if you haven't, you know, follow him on Instagram. Somebody who just works constantly, I mean, not like insanely, but obviously a ridiculous work ethic, creating new videos and new drawings every day. Albrecht Dürer, the, the guy who thought he was God, basically, and he might as well have been because he was really, really good. Um, came up during the time that printmaking starts getting popular. And i um, just going to make sure, good, we're still recording. So printmaking's just getting popular when he is is starting to uh, draw and paint and all this sort of stuff. So he has a very printmakerly approach, which is really quite methodical, actually. Qui <clears throat> Gigé, giant giant drawings on the on the wall. You know, maybe you don't need paper. You can just go straight onto the wall with brush and ink, simple materials, and uh, they can be made into all these different forms. Here we have this giant landscape with these different roads and stuff like that. Really pretty powerful to be one person and be able to make this giant drawing like that on a wall. But again, materials, using simple materials. Mikey Yates, this is one of my friends, and um, he just he makes a lot of domestic scenes of people that are close to him and also creates work based on he's, his... Um, intercultural experiences being a Filipino person raised in the United States and born in Germany and all these sort of things coming together um, in his drawings. But look at this again, just simple dark shape in that white of the face. This is the stuff that's nice. Like if there was a bunch of crap behind her face, we wouldn't really get to see her face. So when we get a nice, you know, think about giving your eye a place to rest. Look, we don't need a lot of dog. We don't need a lot of dog details. We barely, that's the eye. There's barely anything happening in that eye. That's all we need. That's the ear. Boop. Yeah, done. Bill Plimpton made a lot of awesome cartoons in the 80s. And um, I absolutely love them. Check those out as well um, on YouTube. All his drawings, they're all hand-drawn cartoons of people's heads kind of exploding and moving around. But again, very, very quick drawings and uh, color pencil and pencil. That's all you need. Marlena Dumas, she's uh, created a lot of, I think she's British as well, and did a lot of drawings. These They're known for being kind of painfully simple. So when you see the creation of this drawing, if you're trying to recreate this and you don't do it fast, it's not going to work, right? You can't make that brush mark slowly. You got to work quickly the way she works. If you want it to work, make it like that. So these are really quiet, simple drawings, but very well thought out and very well placed features and everything. Jean-Michel Basquiat, of course, everybody loves uh, Basquiat. He uh, came up in the 1980s, was known for being friends with Andy Warhol, and they collaborated, collaborated on a lot of uh, paintings together as well. He dated Madonna for a little while. Unfortunately died, I believe, when he was 26 or 27 years old. However, during his, his life, he created a, a really amazing collection of work and really just attacked, attacked the paper with, again, seemingly simple materials. Colored pencil. This looks just like colored pencil. That's all it is. And a very crude, straightforward style 
Um, but one that really resonates and feels so energetic. His drawings feel so energetic, and I think that's what people really love about them so much, is that there is this energy, and we can really feel the artist behind it. It's not somebody trying to to get rid of the artist's hand. We want to see the artist's hand in the work, and that's what Basquiat does so well. Cy Twombly, here we got nothing but scribbles. You know, I, I need a little bit. Give me something to hold on to. But if you want to just get scribbly with nothing to hold on to at all, then you got Cy Twombly. He also did a bunch of drawings on chalkboards, too. Lola Gill, I absolutely uh, love her paintings. Fantastic painter. Makes the best sweater paintings around, I tell you. <laughs> the, the sweaters are amazing. The sweaters alone, that's all I need. Um, but also these drawings creating these different type of characters going into different situations um, in you know this girl with the the foxes they're just great but fantastical but they seem real they seem rooted in something that could be a reality that we exist in it's not you know science fiction sort of stuff it's like folksy realistic uh, whimsical situations just great Juan Ugolo is a great person to look at if you're, again, just looking for the, the nuts and bolts. The guy kind of draws like an architect. Yeah, I mean, he's just like, burk, 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 burk. you know, this goes here, is this square, right? Think about the edges of your canvas. Look at him. He's got calculations going on. What? <laughs> you know, totally different than the way I look at drawing, but really amazing. And when you see his paintings, they're so well planned. And again, those patches that indicate um, the form the planes of the body, he is the master of that, if you want to see those. Chris Orfili is, uh, got into some trouble for making this collage of the Virgin Mary that was put on ele elephant dung uh, at a s show called Sensation. Um, but makes, you know, forget about that stuff. That's just, you know, media controversy nonsense. The, the drawings and the paintings are just amazing, and oftentimes they use these these little forms and these little circles or little squares to create almost a mosaic effect in these drawings. Look at more of them. He's got all sorts of different drawings. They're, they're amazing. Um, this one is almost purely abstract, but we can see how much we can do just with line. Um, lines going one direction, lines going the other direction. Just how much form and how much stuff starts undulating in here. Nancy Mladenov, uh, I, I met her about four years ago as well, and she creates a lot of different drawings of women in, like, bands or, like, fishing, and they're, like, in kind of typical male-type photos, but it's, like, two women, like, holding up a fish, um, these types of things, but also these, like, punk rock, punk rock, uh, riot girl drawings as well, which I just think are awesome. Look at these lights. We don't need much for the lights. We just need a little indication of these lights. Composition's awesome. Look at that guitar. How cool that guitar is, right? Um, really amazing stuff. Really fun, amazing stuff. Wayne White was a guy who worked for Pee Wee's Playhouse. We're halfway through, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and he worked at, at Pee Wee's Playhouse making all sorts of different drawings and puppets and stuff like that for the, for the show. And uh, again, you can see kind of this commercial cartoony approach he has since made a documentary called everything is beautiful which is an awesome documentary to check out if you haven't seen it um find it and watch it it's just a great documentary on on being an artist in general and he's got this amazing loose style his son's a painter um actually i think both of his kids are painters and um very very loose style very commercial kind of cartoony approach but something that can be applied to, you know, family members or famous people or all sorts of, or, or making stuff out of your imagination. And a lot of these, I think, you know, are these kind of imaginary characters, you know, this, this type of guy here. Um, really fun. Surat is great to look at if you're just looking at, you know, slight variations of value. Dark, light, no line. We don't need line, right? There's no lines in this. Where's the lines? They're nowhere, right? Just big areas of shadow, as painterly as you can get. He's known for making the pointillism stuff, of course, uh, featured in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which has one of the greatest 
uh, museum visiting scenes you'll ever see. And uh, here we just see these slight variations of dark and light and the bodies kind of coming slowly out, almost like they're embedded in the paper in these. Degas, one of the greatest drawers of all time. Again, look how loose this is. We don't need that. We don't need that edge. We need the edge. We don't need the edge of that right there. There's no need for it. Look at this. Just keep it, keep it loose. Then look at that face. Tighten it up. Tighten it up in the good spots. Keep it loose in the other spots. That's what Degas is all about. But look at, look at how uh, abstract these forms get. That book. Just the idea of a book. Brick, brick, brick. That's all we need. Three little lines. DDA William, a uh, contemporary African American painter, creates these forms out of these eyeballs that are kind of morphing and amorphous eyeballs that create all these different forms. A lot of amazing black and white work. Um, search for more of him online too if, if you like this one. Search for more of his uh, drawings because you'll find a lot of figures that are made out of these eyeballs and like going and exploding and then these paintings really resonate they feel like they're electric or something kim slate taking a really like illustrative approach but again um looks just like prismacolor i think in this probably a little watercolor uh as well but thinking about the how did you know a drawing like this come to be it didn't just come to be by somebody starting off in one spot. It starts off with a sketch, it starts off with different characters, it starts with bringing all those things together and then finalizing the drawing itself. It's a, a really illustrative approach, I guess we could call it, but it's one way of thinking about drawing. So when you're, when you're getting into drawing, like I'm saying, it's important to know the process of how other people make drawings because a lot of times people think, oh, I'm just going to start drawing. They get a piece of paper, they get some pencils, and they're like, I don't know, what am I supposed to do, right? So um, these types of drawings, there's a whole approach to them. They're very methodical in the way they're created. Sri Whipple, look at this, you know, just looking at what looks like a, um, a bonsai plant or some sort of plant creature, but look at, you know, just looking closely. Think about what it means just to look closely at objects in your house or a plant in your, you know, on your windowsill or whatever it is. Look at how closely you can look at things and how much detail you can just get from looking at the objects around you and how they start turning into different sort of things. Marie Sundak, I love Marie Sundak, Where the Wild Things Are, but just an amazing person, an amazing drawer. Um, I guess we'd call him an illustrator because he was, you know, illustrating books and stuff like that. But Look for the video of him on the, the Colbert Report, I think did an interview with him that's absolutely fantastic. Um, just his approach to life is, is really great. And his creatures, I mean, the, it, these are Maurice Sendek creatures. So he, he created not only, you know, an illustrator, but somebody who really created an entire world that people have, have all got into for decades and decades now. Leonardo da Vinci, you know, if we're looking at the beautiful, we also got to look at the uh, the grotesque, which is part of the Renaissance as well. Oftentimes we forget about that. But here we've got just brown ink, brush, that's it. That's what's annoying, like I said. But again, look how loose this is. You know, it can be good to do copies, do master copies of this sort of stuff. Again, we see the light outline, dark background, right? We want to make that light pop a little bit. Okay, I'll put a dark background behind it. That's a concept we still use all the time. Da Vinci used it too. doesn't make him a genius. We all do it. Ralph Bakshi, awesome animator from the 70s. Um, you can watch a movie he made called Wizards, which is super cool and weird. It's about, like, this whole world he created... Um, that has like Hitler and World War II and all this sort of stuff in it, um, but in like a science fiction sort of setting. Really amazing drawings, super loose, made a bunch of different animations, um, but just super cool, weird characters that he created. And a lot of them are just, again, pen and ink drawings. <clears throat> Mab Graves, a current contemporary artist, 
And she's also creating a lot of these uh, what appear to be kind of young girls in whimsical, fantastical settings. So the, we have like a winged girl with dinosaurs um, in the background. And again, just, just going with, with pencil and paper, no need to mess around with digital or any of that stuff. Just pencil and paper, and you can create this entire world where these people live. Matisse, I mean, okay, so some people like Picasso, some people like Matisse. Picasso was not the nicest person in the world, putting it lightly, and um, he was kind of rambunctious. He was going to brothels, he was drinking, you know, he had a million women and a million lovers with those women as well, and um, he lived this very artistically uh, full life, I guess we could say, in the stereotypical art, bohemian artist uh, idea. Matisse, on the other hand, talks about, I want, I want drawing and painting to, to be like a, an armchair that you sit in at the end of the day and you're just like, oh, ah, I don't have to deal with all this stuff, right? You know, <laughs> I don't want to look at Guernica in a, in a town where people are dying and this sort of stuff. I just want to, I want to see beauty. I want to see pattern. I want to see flowers, right? That's why we love Matisse. Um, it's all of that. But look at look at this sort of stuff. What? The finger going into that arm? Does it get, I mean, any more, like, luscious than this? Any more elegant? Is it possible? So Matisse, he also made a lot of, famously made a, bu a bunch of cut-ups when he couldn't draw as well when he got older. And just started cutting up pieces of paper. They're also just amazing. Just good. <laughs> I like Picasso more. M.C. Escher uh, was a painter or printmaker. A lot of these are done on lithographs. So lithograph is just a big piece of sandstone. And you use a crayon and you do all these processes to it. It's really difficult and takes a million steps. And then you can make a bunch of prints um, from a lithograph. Um, so a lot of these would be sketched and then they would have to sketch it on the stone. So you got a real physical stone. It's a piece of um, limestone, and you got your sketch, and then maybe you transfer your sketch onto the stone, and then you redraw it on the stone. Stone. So this would be, I'm sure, many sketches before this was made, finally on the stone. Emi Nakajima. So looking at these, just pure, you know, detail. Just going straight up detail, more detail, more detail, right? Little pens. Looks like we got some, some drawing, right? We always want to make it more complicated, but it's not. Pen, paper, preliminary drawing. Time every day. Just takes time. A lot of times people think, how could I ever do that? Well, think about it. If you work three hours or four hours a day on something, after a month... That's like 90 hours. You can get a lot done, you know? So you got to just pace yourself and you got to be really disciplined. Obviously, she's a very, very disciplined artist. She's not getting ahead of herself. She's not like, oh, I want this to be done so I can put it up on Instagram. She's just taking it easy and making it. Larry Bob Phillips, I, I got to make a, a mural with, I guess I could say. I got to work a little bit on a mural. Very limited experience, but... Um, had dinner with him as well and all around a really really great guy and makes these psychedelic uh drawings on the sides of buildings and stuff and this is just speedball ink i know this because we bought it together and um it's just that big thing of speedball ink big black thing of speedball ink put it in a plastic cup have a pen or have a brush that's it it's all he, he uses to make this white wall speedball black Emma Stern, uh, you'll find her on Instagram as Lava Baby, and she makes a lot of drawings based on different um, figures, like 3D models that you create um, in those 3D programs that you often see, these video games that are kind of sexualized as well. And she makes drawings of these 3D models. So this is just a pencil drawing, again, but it's of a, a 3D model, so that's why it looks kind of digital. Enoi Domier. Uh, the great caricaturist um, of France, I think around 1850 or so, made a lot of character caricatures of politicians, but also just had a great arm, had a really gestural, loose style, 
which was quite amazing as well. Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, famously a little person who was hanging out in the bars and the brothels and all the places that you could imagine hanging out in Paris at that time, but an unbelievably quick eye. These are done from life. People struggle to do this stuff from photos now. These are just quick sketches done from life. Look at that hand. Boom, boom. Pop the hand in like that. This fuzzy thing around her wrist. Just a couple indications needed to make that entire form. Pretty amazing. Gonna make sure I'm still rolling. Yep. Good. Egan Sheila. Everybody goes through an Egan Sheila phase, I think. I'm pretty sure it, it's almost mandatory. Um, Egan Sheila is Czech. Of course, I'm in Prague, Czech Republic. Um, but he's a, he, I guess they would call him an Austrian artist or German. Who knows? The, everything's all mixed up. Um, Austro-Hungarian, all this sort of stuff. But his mom was from uh, Chesky Krumlov. And you can actually go visit his studio in Chesky Krumlov in Czech Republic now. And he famously did these really um, kind of angular, tortured figure. This is a pretty nice uh, Egan Sheila. Most of, a lot of his drawings are really angular people in cramped, uncomfortable situations. And so a lot of people still love this very angsty look to a lot of his drawings. James Ensor is a, a painter. His, his parents ran a junk store famously. And he made a lot of paintings where it kind of looked like everybody wore masks. So a famous outsider artist, somebody who's not necessarily trained in the arts, but consistently making absolutely understood art um, from Belgium and um, created these amazing drawings just of people in, in situations, public situations and the like. Elfons Mucha, um, another Czech artist who is creating, most well-known for creating these uh, big posters of Sarah Bernhardt, who was a, a uh, dancer in Chicago. And he got a contract. Mucha's story is kind of sad because everybody loves these drawings he did. They're really comic booky. If you saw him more, you'd recognize him. And uh, he, did, he famously didn't like making those drawings, actually. So, unfortunately, a lot of those drawings that he made... He, he didn't really care about. And then later on in life, he made this series of paintings called the Slav Epic. And it's the entire history. It's like seven, 800 years of Slavic history. Um, and by then it was like 1930s and, you know, cubism happened and all this. So everybody's like, we don't care about this like realistic, social realistic painting about history. Like this is stuff from the last century. What are you doing? So they're, they're huge. You know, these are like 30 foot by 50 foot paintings and there's like 30 of them. Um, that are completely covered with figures. So he worked on it for, you know, decades and decades and uh, never got saw seen. And um, it was up in some castle forever. And they finally got it out. Now it's a big thing in Prague. You can you can visit it if you come to Prague. Um, it's a pretty amazing big collection of paintings. <clears throat> Bridget Riley, you know, come on. We're in the 1960s. What are you going to do, right? Um, psychedelic, simple black and white drawings. Alice Neal, self-taught artist, um, created a lot of portraits just of people, but really known for just capturing this this feeling of people. Like the, it feels like this seem, just seems like such an authentic, genuine look at somebody. Um, there's some distortions that that work all the time in her paintings. You know, these ears are kind of popping out, and this hair hands a little bit too small or whatever. But it doesn't matter. It's got this feel of that person in the drawing itself. Chantal Joffe, so just seeing simple washes. Don't need much. Again, if you do this style, you gotta do it quick, which means you gotta do a hundred of these, literally. Do a hundred of those drawings. You're gonna get one that's good. Frida Kahlo, um, you know, primarily a painter as well, but you can see, look at how, you know, she was making, of course, she was married to Diego Rivera, who was making a lot of murals and stuff like that as well um, and you can kind of see almost this muralistic storytelling aspect to her work where she's you know has this surrealistic hand on a canoe type thing back here and then a woman on a bed down here and then some sort of 
dreamlike head, you know, and a hand with roots, all these sort of things all coming into this one drawing. And again, it doesn't need to be a totally detailed drawing. It can just get the idea of it, and that's all. That's good enough. Rembrandt, um, of course, made a lot of amazing drawings. Here we have just uh, graphite of a, a man reclining in, in some sort of a corner, but we can feel the looseness of this drawing. Of course, he's known in his paintings for really layering the paint on in a very methodical approach, but you can see how just how loose and free he was and gestural with these drawings. Look at how simple that hand is. We don't need much of that hand but he just nails every aspect of every single piece that we're looking at. Yayoi Kusama, simple shapes, again, circles, lines, right? Look at that, variation, pattern on pattern. Changing two patterns together, they start vibrating in between. All that lusciousness that happens, just with pattern on pattern. Paul Clay, of course, always known for like drawing like a kid, right? Um, but also an important, uh, I guess we could call him a, a surrealist as well, making these really whimsical landscapes with these figures inside of them. Very simplistic, but they make sense in a very odd way. Look how little those feet are. <laughs> you know, there's a little ball there. Louise Bourgeois, of course, is... Um, uh, a famous French artist who moved to, to New York City and this looks like a, a print of some sort because it looks like it's signed like a print down there. If not, um, it would probably be uh, just wash, just a wash. You could get this effect with a wash and a brush basically. But we've got this cat, this cat image and um, you know, you, you want to make a painting of your cat, like look at this painting of a cat, right? It's like a mystical cat. Um, and she's most famous for making these giant spiders. Uh, there's a great video of her being interviewed by Robert Hughes in um, American Visions documentary where she talks about um, her sculptures, which is a, a, a great clip that you can find on YouTube as well. If You, you can uh, YouTube search uh, Robert Hughes, Louise Bourgeois if you want to watch that. Elizabeth Payton, simple, uh, simplistic colored pencil drawings of beautiful people, <laughs> right? I think she drew a lot from fashion magazines. There's a really famous drawing she did of Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, so famous people done in this very simplistic style with what appears to be just crayon or uh, colored pencil. Frank Frazetta, you know, this guy was a god, me growing up. Um, he, he made a lot of paintings. There was a magazine, I think there still exists, called Heavy Metal is the name of the magazine and it was like an adult uh, comic book I guess kind of um, but I had it when I was way too young and it had a bunch of like gladiators and it was kind of comic book fantasy fiction these sort of things but Frank Frazetta is um, one of the artists who created a lot of these but again drawing from life a commercial approach to drawing illustrative approach to drawing um, you would have to bang these out nonstop. It's not like, oh, I got to take my time. I have a solo show in a year and a half. I, you know, I got to make twelve drawings. This would be like, okay, I need twelve drawings by Friday, and you just have to bang it out. You have no excuse, or no excuse. You have an excuse. You have no choice. Via Tellman's, um, really beautiful. This is just graphite, uh, graphite on paper of the ocean, and she made a lot of paintings just of the ocean. It's graphite. Michalina Thomas, again, we're seeing different types of um, materials coming into play here. We get like some glittery stuff looking there. But again, pattern on pattern on pattern on pattern on pattern on pattern on pattern, right? And it works. It really feels solid and it works as chaotic as it is. It feels solidified. You know, this big black shape here and this kind of square here kind of solidifies the the composition and all this pattern craziness doesn't seem that loud to me. Grace Hardigan, again we see really simple wash uh, brush and washes with black ink and what appears to be charcoal, probably vine charcoal, um, which can be blown away a little bit easier. You, you have to use fixative to get that sort of stuff to stick. 
But again, comp, uh, you know, the composition itself is completely abstract, so you could approach the composition in a totally abstract manner as well. Dali, of course, famous, uh, f famous for becoming uh, almost like a commercial famous painter. You know, he created this entire persona, and it's hard to know what's real and what's not. But there's no doubt he he really loved drawing from an early age and got almost apprenticed for being as late as he was. He started studying um, under a famous artist, I think, by the time he was 14 or 15 years old. And um, so he had a lot of time practicing drawing and painting. Uh, this looks like you can even see this is on notebook paper of some sort. Um, and it's just ink pen, dip pen, you know, the old nib, you dip it into the ink and you can get a lot of line variation just with those. James Audubon, um, of course, did these very beautiful, thought out, quiet watercolor drawings of birds. Um, oftentimes he'd be painting these from dead birds um, themselves, so really observant, really looking at the subjects which he's painting. Max Beckman, German artist, uh, really look how cloistered all these figures are in that space together. And um, how much is happening just with black, white, and how chaotic and loud that composition feels. It's all about the rectangle. How much stuff can you fit in that tiny little rectangle itself? And this is just loud. It's like a loud family dinner. And all everybody's mouth is open and they're all covering their mouths or uh, sneezing or yawning or something like that. It's certainly not a drawing which makes us feel at ease. Gwen John is, uh, you know, again, we, we, we just see simple black and white drawings that are done with washes. Jericho, really, really loose, beautiful uh, horses and, you know, shapes. But again, we see that really fine gesture. Look at this line, how it moves all the way through there. It's one solid movement throughout the whole thing. R. Crumb, he's a famous comic book artist. He worked for Zap Comics in the 1960s and really pen and ink. Um, he started drawing from very, very young age and just studied comics methodically. There's an amazing documentary that you can watch on him as well, uh, produced by uh, David Lynch, actually. And I think it was made around 92 or so. And R. Crumb is, a, you know, some of them are pretty explicit, uh, his comics. Um, but he's got a lot of these very, uh, what we call it, like a, a man who's skinny and nerdy and dorky in all these different types of situations and created a lot of different psychedelic characters in the 1960s as well. Keith Haring, drawing and everything, a great artist from the New York in the 1980s and created these really, really simple figures, you know, that, that all kind of interlock and create these bigger, almost like an Escher type of composition that we see with his. Lee Krasner uh, created these, these drawings that are very uh, rooted in um, abstraction. They feel really abstract, and they're you know, just simple shapes bashing up against each other. But we want to see that figure, and I know for a fact that Lee Krasner actually studied um, under Hans Hoffman as well, who created this figure in um, interior type of method to drawing where you would draw figures just as boxes essentially and um, I got to study with a woman named Elizabeth Ruprecht who also studied with Hans Hoffman in the same technique actually and it was really interesting and we'd have a model in every class but we'd have to just make them into boxes and shapes and abstract shapes it was really fun. Kate Butcher <coughs> um, here we see you know very illustrative drawings again Look at all that black. We need that black in order for this drawing to work. Without all that black, the drawing's not going to work. Erlen Adonis Geffrard. And uh, here we can see different materials being brought into the drawing. The background seems kind of more childlike. Spray paint, these types of characters, very crude. Here's a crude thing uh, collaged right into the front of it. Looks like some hair is even taped on there as well. But again, we just also have this more refined pencil drawing and watercolor on top of that. So really a juxtaposition of all these different styles coming into one drawing itself. Lucian Freud, can't go wrong. Look at the early Lucian Freud drawings. 
uh, really amazing, one of the most important painters of the 20th century. Uh, this looks like 1948 he made this, <clears throat> but uh, I think it's his wife, actually, and again, just pencil, big eyes, little nose, and really creates a sense of character in these as well. <clears throat> Edward Munch, of course, known famously known for The Scream, uh, which is his most famous painting, The Scream. But look at all these little forms. The Scream seems more um, expressive. Of course, he's an expressionist. <clears throat> but in this drawing, we just see these simple forms cascading up against one another. David Hockney can't get any better than David Hockney, made all sorts of drawings, made all sorts of paintings. Again, just a work, absolute workhorse of a person, um, <clears throat> still creating today, born in the UK and uh, operating out of LA for many, many decades, uh, most well known for making paintings of people near their pools. Look how quick this is though. Look at that nice little variation between that blue and that violet. You don't need a lot, you know, restraint. The drawings are a lot about restraint and a lot about that speed at the same time. It's amazing if you can get both. <clears throat> Virgil Finlay, again, kind of taking a, you know, a detective novel approach uh, to drawing and just collaging these different drawings into one thing. And I kind of want to, in showing these types of people, I want people to remember, like, you don't have to think of high art and low art. There can always just be different types of drawing. And I want to know what type of drawings you're interested in if you want to create this sort of thing. You know, it can be like this. I don't care. It doesn't have to be smart and artistic or whatever. Um, it can be more of a detective novel with some aliens in the back and a, a woman in a bikini and a strong-looking man in the front. Wesley Willis uh, was an outsider artist, most famously known for headbutting his fans. He won a composition uh, for, I think, competition was for, like, the worst musician uh, in the world from American um, music. But he did these amazing, these are just ballpoint pens. These are just different colored ballpoint pens, drawings of uh, Chicago. You can see the L right here. <clears throat> I would have loved to, to have got one of his drawings. One of my friends got headbutted in by him at a show. Uh, he was famous for, you know, meeting his, his fans and he'd say, like, rock, and then he'd headbutt you. So he had, like, a bruise in the center of his head um, from headbutting people all the time. I think he was homeless for quite quite some time as well. Uh, Celeste Dupuy Spencer. So here we again see just how much we can fit into this square. And these cartoony figures, they, they seem cartoony, but we still get that sense of form. Um, we're getting more detailed here, less down here. This looks like some sort of sports bar scene. One of the loudest places you can possibly be is in a sports bar in the United States. Max Ernst, really lovely, surreal drawings. Um, also uses collage a lot. But again, look at how simple we can do. This is three values, essentially. Dark, tan, white. Right? Look how much you can do. It's like 12 notes. When you find out, oh, there's only 12 notes in music? What, you can do all this stuff with just the 12 notes? Um, yeah. So, or 12 tones, I should say. 12 tones in music. But it's like the same thing. We don't need much. Jonathan Linden Chase. Here we can see a sketchbook drawing. Very quickly done uh, with different elements. We can think about blue. We don't, we don't have to, you know, as long as the value is the right darkness, we can use value like that. Right? If this blue was too dark, it wouldn't work. So think about... What is the, the color of value is a good way to think about that with drawing. Because drawing is not just black and white. Drawing is also painting. You're all, that, well, you'll also find it in painting all the time. Paul Rigo. Oops. Paul Rigo, I think this is my last one. Yep, it is. And um, Paul Rigo makes these really just beautiful, uh, classical, academic figure drawings uh, that you can see like this one here. Just the form itself. But again, looking for that line through the whole figure. That's often key with these types of figure drawings, is we look for that one line that kind of goes through the whole thing like that. And this is a, a perfect drawing in that way. Again, really loose lines, popping in a little bit of the value, and um, really getting the, the form, how it's lying down 
on those uh, different cushions there. So that's it. Hope you got some different ideas, some different techniques that you can get into and learn about some different artists that hopefully spark you and make you passionate about wanting to create. Um, I'm going to be making more of these live things in the future. So yeah, hit the notifications, do all that sort of stuff and keep up and hopefully we can, we can make some stuff, maybe make some community. Thanks for watching.